Good evening, Western Standard viewers. I'm opinion editor Nigel Hannaford, and you're watching The Hannaford Show. Canadians were scandalized last week when they learned that a man suspected of deep terrorist links with the ISIS organization, a man indeed who had been believed to have been uh, photographed as part of the cast of one of ISIS's infamous execution videos, had been arrested in Canada and has been charged with terrorist activities here. As if that were not enough, it is revealed that he is a Canadian citizen. What are we to make of this? The police have not said what this man, his name is Ahmed El Didi, they, his, they have not said what specifically he was intending to do, he and his son, but uh, edged weapons were removed from the scene of the arrest. People ask how this could happen. How could a terrorist slip through Canada's immigration screening test? And we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to talk about the security implications of Canada's vastly enlarged immigration program. We are taking in something like 400,000 people a year. Are all of them just wanting to be good Canadians as we define good Canadians? With me today, very grateful to have Alex Dale, who is, and I'm going to just read this because this is a, an impressive resume, Alec Dale is a senior fellow and national security project lead at the Ottawa-based McDonald Laurier Institute. And Alex, you have spent more than 20 years in Canada's national security community. Uh, that's the Canada School of Public Service, Department of National Defense, Canada Border Securities Agency. And during that time, you worked across uh, multiple operational and strategic strategic domains. And I notice here you were also attached to the Privy Council Office, which having been in that part of the world, I know is a very big deal. You, sir, are um, an expert. Welcome to the show. Nigel, pleasure to be here. All right. Well, Alex, let's, let's go to the big question. How does an ISIS member slip through the immigration screening net? I have written that the Liberals are very good at grand gestures, like a robust immigration policy, uh, but they're hopeless at actually doing government and taking care of the small details, such as screening people. Mm -hmm. How say you? Well, I would say that some of the challenges, uh, you're exactly right to put it at this question of screening. You know, immigration security screening, screening is a core part of border security and how we maintain the integrity of, of our immigration system. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier 400,000 new permanent residents a year. Actually, we're very close to 500,000 new permanent residents a year. So this is a system working at full speed. Something like 5.2 million applications in the year 2022. Um, you know, we had uh, during that period 430 thousand people apply for permanent residence, you know, that uh, is up to 470,000 in 2023. So we're talking very large numbers. So, you know, within that, you know, the security screening part is only one part of, of the process. Um, but as I said, it's fundamental to maintaining. So, you know, some of these things extend beyond the, the current government. I mean, the challenges of security screening um, certainly predate uh, this government, they predate the Harbour government. I mean, you know, they're an ongoing challenge and you need to involve, evolve with the circumstances in the world. So I pick out a couple of points here about how do you slip through, you know, certainly bigger volume, more, more you know, people coming in, the greater likelihood some of them are gonna be malign um, individuals um, uh, with negative intentions. You know, we have a fundamental tension in the system that the system is designed to bring people into the country, not keep people out, right? There's economic and social motives, motivations for that. And that, that that part, you know, immediately kind of creates a certain balance in the system about, you know, what are the purposes of screening and the overall endpoint, you know, when you're talking hard numbers and reaching hard numbers, there's a pressure to deliver those hard numbers. I think that raises questions about capacity in the system. 
um, you know, we talk a lot uh, about the growth under the, the Trudeau government of the public service, you know, uh, and we've seen those same uh, phenomena, partly at uh, Immigration, uh, Refugee and Citizenship Canada, IRCC, you know, it's gone up like 34% in terms of the people working there. But those people don't primarily work on security, right? They work on the processing and integrating security information in as one part. CBSA, which is really the pointy end of this, the Border Security Agency, um, you know, they're doing a lot of the screening. So a separate ministry, some real benefits to that. But they um, are the ones that are looking at various security dimensions, whether that's terrorism, whether that's war criminality, whether that's organized crime, whether that's a criminal record, uh, all the things that would make you what they call inadmissible to Canada. So there's a capacity question here, I think. CBSA hasn't grown quite as much. And I think there's a fundamental problem in talking solely about human resource growth um, in terms of numbers as opposed to training, knowledge, capabilities. I think there's, you know, I've already alluded to it a bit, preparedness of the system, you know, awareness across the immigration process of national security dimensions. This has been a general challenge in the public service that in today's world with, you know, poly crisis, multiple threat, however you want to call it, there's new ways you have to think about accomplishing domestic goals even, right, let alone international ones. So, so Alex, do you think there's just uh, too few people with too many applications to screen? Um, so I put a bit of nuance on that. I think maybe um, maybe not always the right people with the right skill set, not the right tools to do that effectively. I'd point to two things that, I mean, again, the Canadian government has not been strong on uh, in my experience. One is hiring people with the language skills that are going to make you effective against dealing with the current threat picture. So this is people that pe speak foreign languages whether that's Spanish, whether that's Arabic, Russian, Mandarin, Chinese, Persian, you know, all the different languages, you know, that, that, that you know, some of our uh, threat uh, actors are coming from. Um, you know, I think in terms of what the intelligence community will call open source intelligence. So, I mean, this is using materials that are publicly available, like the video that you speak of that's, you know, currently causing, uh, you know, that, that's being brought to light in the case of, uh, the ISIS arrest last week, you know, you have to be able to find that, you have to be able to identify that, you have to connect it to the individual. There's a lot of tools that are out there now. I think it's important, you know, that 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 Canadians be aware of that and be pushing the government to make sure that the analysts who work on this uh, have access to those tools. So, you know, quantity isn't always quality. I think there is a slight mismeasure between how much immigration has grown, uh, IRCC versus CBSA, the border service. You know, the border service is not just people doing intelligence and immigration screening. I mean, these are the people who are right at the front lines on the borders. And I mean, there is a question, too, for the immigration officers who are IRCC people working at our embassies and missions abroad, you know, how they're being equipped and positioned to, to deal with this, too. Do they have the intelligence that they need? Are they getting that support uh, from across the system? So, yeah, I'm a little reluctant to throw in more people at problems all the time. I think that, you know, in some cases, there is just a basic need. If we look in the past, you know, at, you know, uh, terrorist cases that, that have led to catastrophe, um, you know, often say the security services will be following five groups, but it was the sixth group, right, that, that eluded their, their net. Um, so, you know, those are raw human numbers. It, it takes numbers to process information, to do surveillance, to do all the things that are, can potentially be important to law enforcement. So... Um, but I, I would caution that this uh, is an issue where we need to be thinking about technology and we need to be thinking about the training, background, and knowledge that the people doing this work have. So at, as things stand, it's probably with 400,000, 500,000 people to screen, uh, there is probably a failure rate that doesn't mean the system isn't working. It's just that anything, any procedure that is done repetitively, there will be fails. I mean, we were talking uh, earlier about the the number of people coming in and what kind of a what would what would one tenth of one percent look like? It's obviously still quite a a number of uh, potential fails there. But um, one of the things that if I were writing talking points for the Liberal government as mm -hmm. they try to defend themselves, 
now that the Conservatives and the NDP have united to ask for a, a, a special meeting on this matter, right. I would say, well, you know, it doesn't happen very often. And I mean, it's really we're a pretty peaceful country and everybody's integrating very well. Then I would say, but then I would, if I were writing for the Conservatives, I would say this stuff happens all the time, sir. It's, uh, look at the Air India crash. There's 350 people killed there. Uh, back in uh, 85, look at the uh, plans of the Toronto 18 who are going to um, bomb the CN Tower and try and storm Parliament and behead people on camera, you know. Look at the, uh, we had well, this trouble within the Sikh community, which has been very high profile, uh, Mississauga event. So actually, there is a problem. So let me ask you, as the expert in field here, Alex, should Canadians be concerned? Well, I think Canadians should demand that the national security screening, security screening process be as modern, advanced, and world leading. We want to be a world leader in, in, in uh, immigration, bringing people in, then the integrity of the system deeply matters, uh, you know, both for the planned outcomes and for the general trust and confidence that Canadians have in this. Look, our immigration system overall is a, is a success. I mean, you know, our prosperity, et cetera. I mean, there's very little question that the benefits of, of immigration are huge. You know, we will not see changes in immigration that, that don't see us bringing in hundreds of thousands of people. Now, there's a can debate whether half a million is the, is the right number or is it 300,000? But I, I don't think anyone's going to change that political consensus. You know, Canada is a rare status pretty much amongst all of our allies that, you know, immigration is not a controversial issue much of the time in this country. And we need to work very hard to keep it that way. So, you know, in terms of, you know, thinking about this, I mean, you know, like the existence of, of, of within these streams of people who elude and have, you know, intentions that are, are damaging to the Canadian populace, this is just a function of, of what goes on in the immigration system. In Canada, one thing that worries me, Nigel, it's been very historical here, is, is we have what I call Canadian exceptionalism. We tend to imagine that somehow we're excluded from a lot of the trends that are shaping the rest of the world. Partly that's a function of being in North America, protected by three Cs, having a generally you know, very productive partner to the South. Um, but you know whether you're talking about terrorism, as you mentioned with the examples that you've given, whether you're talking about organized crime, drug trafficking, money laundering, whether you're talking about people, you know, seeking to, uh, you know, um, who've worked for oppressive regimes, you know, flee here and, and hide, war criminals, all these things exist, right? Uh, and, and that does need to be accepted. I mean, I, I don't think it's an indictment of the entire system, but I, I think, you know, we have a general problem in this country across the board um, in taking national security seriously, somehow thinking, oh, well, the Americans will deal with that, or they face more problems, or this is something in the Middle East, or this is something in Europe. Um, I think, you know, as you, as you, uh, you know, your examples show, I mean, we, we've had issues with, with terrorism over, over decades. I think, frankly, we're doing a better job at understanding that, uh, you know, some of these issues, uh, you know, come. And I mean, you know, and let's face it too, right? I mean, you know, there, there's an issue between people eluding the immigration, you know, system. And then there's a question of becoming criminalized and radicalized in Canada after that fact, right? I mean, and this happens as well. So, you know, the immigration part, I, I think, comes down to, in my mind, you know, if you want to maintain the integrity of the system, the trust in the system, you can't deprioritize the national security piece. It's specialists. It's about a small number of people. But, you know, how many people were involved in 9-11? I mean, how, how many people does it take to, to conduct a, a mass attack event? I mean, you know, looking at, you know, a known ISIS member or at least someone who joined the group had, com you know, potentially committed atrocities before coming to Canada. You know, we've seen the mass attacks with machetes, with, with other things. Um, you know, Canada is, is unfortunately in the same space as many of our partners and allies that's worrying, but it can also be a source of comfort. You know, we've got partners we can work on this with, and I think that's, you know, part of where part of the solution is, in fact. You know, I wonder, Alex, sometimes if we, if the RCMP and CSIS are actually too good at it, because if nothing happens, people will start to think that there isn't a problem. You mentioned 9-11 a moment ago, and after that happened, everybody knew that it was a huge problem. 
And then I started, at that time I was still in, uh, in a, before my time in government, uh, but so I was paying attention to this through a news lens, but I noticed a number of reports coming through of foiled plots. And of course they made a headline, page three, for a day. Right. And then, oh, well, we took care of that and everything is all right. Whereas in actual fact, this stuff is going on all the time. Yeah. And as it was famously said, we have to be on it 100% of the time. They only, they, the bad guys, only need to succeed once. Yeah, and that's right. Alex, once, uh, once is all it would take, I think, to make this country very, seem very untrustworthy in the eyes of its allies. What, what would you say to that? Well, Nigel, I mean, we, we don't look like a credible partner with our allies on so many issues right now. So, you know, the ability, you know, we've done a very poor job at, at defending, you know, being ready to defend our own territory in the Arctic. You know, we're not getting and we're not showing commitment. And again, the Trudeau, Trudeau government is, is, is very much responsible for this, but we're not seeing a strong case from any of the opposition parties about getting a 2% of defense spending, you know, a primary ingredient in, 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 in credibility. So, you know, you know, there is death by a thousand cuts. And, and I think as you're alluding, I mean, it could might be more than a cut. It could be a full slice, right? I mean, um, so I, I do think we have the added issue, uh, as Canadians will be aware, but it's very good to put this, is that, you know, in an election year in the United States, we're going to hear a lot of things articulated. Americans have a lot of concerns about the border. While many of those relate to the southern border with Mexico, you know, you can be sure, I mean, we've seen it already, that, you know, that also turns attention to the northern border and what's going on in the northern border. And given how important to us trade, movement, you know, back, you know, whether it's for going to Taylor Swift concerts or whether it's, you know, sealing the deal on a multi-billion dollar automotive or oil exports, whatever, you know, that relationship is crucial to us. So I think, you know, we have to be extra attentive here, not necessarily because we're worse or we're better or the problems are more severe or they're more light, but the politics of this are clearly uh, very, very explosive. Well, let me and, push you on that point a yeah, little. Alex. How damaging would it be to trade across the border if a serious event was perpetrated in the United States by people who were based in Canada as citizens or landed immigrants even? You know, it would be politically an extremely hot potato. You have to keep in mind constantly that from the U.S. perspective, borders are as much a matter of security as about trade, right? They, they certainly have a stronger bias and willingness to disrupt international like trade flows into the country if um, they are, um, uh, you know, if they see a risk there, whereas Canada is very much pushing more for open border, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's a bridge we don't want to cross, <laughs> to be quite honest. Now, again, you know, like if you talk at the official level, I mean, I think most people understand. I mean, these are, are shared issues. Um, but, you know, there's a general perception that Canada is laxer and has fewer, you know, pointy end tools to, to deal with this. So, uh, you know, I, I think we need to take it very seriously. Now, in, in your view, how seriously does the government of Canada react to expert advice? I, I'm thinking back to uh, the recently retired experience of uh, CSIS director David Vigneault. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who was publicly diminished by the prime minister who more or less said, well, you know, these, the, the, I'm paraphrasing the prime minister's remarks, but they were to the general effect that it's good that we've got these eager gumshoes, but they go overboard sometimes. And we, we have to give everything second thought and check and consider and so forth. Um, I found that uh, uh, highly objectionable. Mm -hmm. uh, or Mr. Vino did as well, and I noticed that he retired from his post not too long after that. But you have had 20 years in the system. How good are the links from people who actually discover something through their chain of command to the government of the day? Let's not be partisan. Both right. it's a problem for both uh, for both parties when they form government. How good are those? 
links from the field to the uh, the boardroom table where the decisions must be made. You know, that, that's a clearly a, a constant work and process, you know, in a, in a democracy with changing political staff, et cetera. You know, in the Canadian case, we have a very, very stable bureaucracy, very professionalized, uh, right up to the deputy minister level. So, you know, there's always a, a building of trust that, that has to happen there on any, on any policy issue uh, on that. You know, I think what's really obvious to me is that, you know, national security still takes the back foot uh, or, you know, is in the kind of back burner pretty much constantly. So, you know, that information, I think, is it's, it's harder to get, um, you know, it, it, it presented in ways that, you know, show the government of the day what agenda, you know, how it, it fits their agenda. And I think we've gotten very used in this country to thinking that, you know, again, going back to this idea of exceptionalism, that, you know, it's um, simply a case of, of, Oh, meeting the government's agenda, as opposed to this, you know, increasingly dangerous world intervening on that agenda. So, you know, the government has made some good announcements uh, in terms of setting up a national security council at the Privy Council office to, to address some of these issues. But that only comes down to how seriously the prime minister and his staff take those issues. And I think, you know, for any country, I mean, no country wants to have to deal with these. You'd much rather focus on your prosperity, on your, you know, the, the health and well-being of, of your, your people, et cetera. But, you know, I think there needs to be a greater sense of awareness that this just goes with the turf and that all those other things you want to do need to have that information flowing, you know, the perspectives being collected, you know, analyzed, put together by your police, by your border service officers, immigration officers, intelligence officers. Alex, uh, as we mentioned before, the two of the opposition parties have called upon the government to reconvene the public, the parliamentary public safety committee to, to hear how this situation arose, where somebody who had been a member of ISIS allegedly became a Canadian citizen and now stands accused of uh, plotting an atrocity in, right. here in Canada. I want you to uh, just think about what, what would you say to that committee if they invited you to testify? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first and foremost, we need to think a lot about, you know, the points on the points I made earlier around how are we staffing these positions? What skill sets do we need to have? You know, if you want to prevent these things, you know, you need a pretty worldly um, security screening process. So again, people understand dynamics in different parts of the world, understand all those relate to Canada, have the tools both linguistically to, to analyze, assess, identify information elsewhere, have the digital tools that allow them to synthesize information to pull together those pictures, etc. So, you know, the human resourcing and, and how we develop those human resources and the technology, I think, are, are absolutely central to uh, having, you know, tightening up this system and identifying the threat. You know, again, you know, I would certainly have opening remarks in that respect to the fact that we have this world where we don't just have to worry about terrorists. We have to worry about espionage. We have to worry about proxies of foreign state governments that want to do us harm. We have to worry about, you know, people who may have done corrupt actions, etc. People who are coming to intimidate Canadians because of their views about authoritarian regimes, you know, uh, dissidents, etc., who fled here and are, are you know, speaking about their country. Um, you know, the, ultimately, this is about protecting Canadians, whether they became a Canadian citizen yesterday or whether they were born here and, you know, uh, were born here. So, you know, again, we can't indulge, I think, some of the problems of the past where, you know, after 9 11, we became very focused on terrorism. Uh, one type of terrorism even, we have to understand that the world isn't going to know us on this. You know, all kinds of people are coming at us from, from different ways. Uh, there's still lots of benefit, mostly benefit we can reap from being, you know, open to the world. But if you're going to do that, there's a concomitant part that says, you know, you need to take the national security part seriously. And as much as the RCMP actually uh, had suspicions, follow their suspicions, made an arrest, you might make the argument, well, actually, we're doing pretty well on this on this uh, mission, and uh, we're getting it right. You could say that, and I dare say they will say that. 
Well, I don't want to pl- downplay it. I mean, Nigel, it is a success. I mean, if you if you catch people before they do something, I mean, you know, like we should be very grateful that the RCMP on this case and others, but I mean, others have slipped through and I, you've spoken about this a couple of times. I mean, it is a dilemma, right? I mean, when the security services, when the police do their job, there is sometimes kind of a, an alternate reaction, like, oh, we're at risk, right? We're at more danger, you know, because, you know, but, but I think the thing is, is that, you know, like there, you know, this won't be the end of it. It's never like, you know, wipe our hands and we're done. Um, so, you know, success can be well, success. Again, seems like a strong word here, doesn't it? When you, you know, by the you know, skin of your teeth, uh, avoid a potential atrocity. But, you know, I mean, so, I mean, Canadians can have confidence that, that the system, you know, isn't entirely broken, but, you know, like it, it needs constant work and it needs to update. And I think Canadians really need to be on their government across public policy about the uptake on technology, the standards, you know, the human resource standards uh, of people. Again, I'm not denigrating anyone in there. There's lots of very talented people. Um, but, you know, there always needs to be a focus on training. Military exemplary for that, right? Constantly training their people. Public service doesn't always do that. And I think you made the point earlier that uh, if you want to maintain the integrity of the entire system the, of immigration and international trade, this is the area that you have to get right. Nigel, we're seeing this on so many issues, right? I mean, confidence in the economy, confidence in foreign investment, confidence in, you know, um, drug makers, you know, confidence in so many things. Like, we need to see that the government, when necessary, has the ability to intervene on issues, you know, whether it is, you know, again, a foreign state trying to buy into critical resources or Wire an airfield, you know, in, in a place, port technology, uh, port access, etc. You know, whether it's our financial system and the entry of, of, you know, dirty money into that, you know, the integrity of these systems depends on taking the threat of nefarious, if you want to use that language, actors seriously. And, you know, everything is not always going to be easy and is not always going to, you know, unfortunately, people will take advantage uh, of these things. Happily, in most cases, for far less serious issues. Um, but, you know, as you said, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a no-fail mission, right, And on many parts of this. I mean, you know, even if you only let one bad person through, if they commit something, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, cannot be diminished. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I would say there. Alex, I think we should. Uh, I think should we should be glad of the good work of the RCMP in this case, and uh, wish them more of the same. It's been great to have you on the show, sir, and uh, certainly want to commend you for the work that you are doing in this area, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for tonight for the Western Standard. I'm Nigel Hannaford, and thank you again to Alex Dale. All the best. <laughs>